All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got quite a bit of information to cover in this session. First of all, let me say it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Tom Anders. I work in the Structures Design Office in Tallahassee, where I oversee the Bridge Plans Review Group. The title of this training session is Precast Bridge Component Feasibility Assessment, Utilizing Prefabricated Bridge Elements and Systems, or PBES, is an important aspect for accelerating bridge projects. The purpose of this talk is to cover some of the unique features of PBES in order to ensure successful project implementation. Our roadmap for today is as follows. First, I'm going to talk about the six barriers to PBES implementation. Whoops. Let's see if this will work for me. Okay, I'm going to talk about the six barriers to PBS implementation. These are barrier number one, the four legged stool dilemma, barrier number two, the project variability quandary, barrier number three, beam camber predictability impasse. Barrier number four, the settlement predicament. Barrier number five, the fit-up conundrum. And lastly, barrier number six, the temporary load difficulty. For each of these barriers, I plan to give you an overview of the challenge and then offer some strategies for overcoming the particular obstacle. Then together at the end of the talk, we'll discuss a project example that proposes several PBS challenges to successful implementation. And uh, we'll work through this case study, which I think you'll find very interesting, and, and we'll be able to use some of the, the, the things that we talked about today to ensure uh, successful implementation of the particular project. Okay, before I get started, let me repeat a famous quote from an ultra-determined master tinkerer and inventor which changed our world. Thomas Edison was famous for saying, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Edison had another famous quote you might recall that said, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. These quotes, I, I think, say a lot about the man that not only invented a practical filament for the light bulb lighting up a single lab room, he also developed a patent for one of the first electrical distribution systems, and with a little help from a guy named Tesla and Westinghouse, allowed for full implementation of Edison's original in, uh, invention, the light bulb, which ultimately lit up the world. It's kind of cool how one man can develop something like a light source and then make it available to the masters, to the masses, and be able to do that in one lifetime. Today's talk will mainly focus on implementation strategies for PBS by learning from the past in order to take PBS technologies out of the lab and into the wider world. This talk begins by focusing on the barriers to PBS implementation and then concentrates on ways to overcome these barriers. Also, when it comes to successful implementation of prefabricated bridge elements and systems, or PBS, um, as you'll probably see today, the devil's really in the details. Hopefully today's discussion will help you think about some of the detailing issues that will ensure a successful project. Also, in this training, I, I want to say that I, I play the role as the devil's advocate here. This critical viewpoint is intentional on my part. It is only when one discusses some of the implementation pitfalls from which real solutions can then be discussed and employed. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The first barrier to PBS implementation is what I call the four-legged stool dilemma. This issue comes up a lot when discussing PBS implementation strategies. Of course, a three-legged stool is perfectly stable. A stool with more than three legs is prone to rocking. Many PBS components have inherent four-legged stool challenges. Certainly, double T's are one example, 
Here you can see a stiff concrete pretension double T on the top and a less stiff rolled steel girder double T section on the bottom. Certainly both systems are prone to rocking if um, there's non-uniform bearing, right? Albeit the steel option may be less prone to rocking and more prone to slab cracking due to any non-uniform bearing than the stiffer concrete option. And the real issue here is when you have live loads, this thing is going to rock back and forth, right? So a few questions come to mind when you have PBS systems with four or more bearing points. How do you define the leveling step? And if there's no leveling step to ensure uniform bearing, has the design accommodated the additional stresses in the closure pores? These things want to rock back and forth under live load. How about the additional stresses in the units themselves? This issue is real based on past lessons learned. As many of you may know, FDOT used to have a double T standard. One of the reasons it was pulled was due to this rocking issue that I'm talking about here. Other structure types that are prone to rocking include full or partial spans that are cast at near site casting yards and then rolled into place using self-propelled modular transporters. The two photos here show the near site casting yard and the span move on the Gray's Avenue I-4 project near Orlando. And if you look at the, the, the the, uh, the foreground is the casting yard in the background as you can actually see the span being rolled in. A few things come to mind. How close to the pier cap bearing elevations are the relative elevations of the near side casting yards? How close do they have to match the bearing elevations of the bridge pier? How are the elevations in the near side casting yard controlled against potential settlement of the shallow shoring system that's usually used like you can see in this case? More on that issue later. If the production pier cap is also precast, um, the challenges related to leveling this span are more difficult. Again, not only is the relative differences between the bearing elevations important, but also how parallel adjacent supports are to prevent warping of the span. I would argue that in spite of your best intentions to match the relative bearing heights, that including a leveling step is a much more practical way of solving the four-legged stool problem. In fairness, the, Gra the, the Graves Avenue project went off, went, went off without a hitch. Um, we were able to match the relative uh, near side casting yard bearing elevations to the bridge pier. The point here, though, is if you want to be able to come up with precast roll-in options on a big scale, and speed is important, and you've got to be able to maybe one day address what are you going to do with precast uh, substructure options as well, you, you, and you want to, this, these sorts of wider applications, you might need to come up with um, additional solutions than simply controlling the bearing elevation. Let's talk about some possible solutions uh, to prevent rocking of the precast elements. You could wait to cast the pedestals or grind the pedestals, but how do you know, you know, basically that's kind of a timing issue. Okay, what about this? What about allowing a single shimming element to be stacked between the composite pad and an embedded plate which is cast into the end of the beam? An epoxy adhesive may actually be necessary to ensure that all seismic requirements are met because, you know, you don't want the, the superstructure to slide off the substructure. The leveling step may include requiring the contractor to have various thickness shims on hand and then you'd use micrometers or feeler gauges during the precast component placement uh, stage to determine shim thickness and placement requirements. Then after the shims are and the epoxy is in place, uh, you attempt to rock the element because you know you still have the crane attached um, and you check that all bearing po points um, are in contact. So you could do that. The question I leave you with is whether this leveling step still requires some over design of the bearings or beam elements to compensate for non-uniform bearing. Uh, because just because the member's in contact, um, what does that really mean about what's really going on? Let me just say this, if a design build firm were to propose this detailed leveling step, we would probably be okay with no over design provisions. 
But if there was not a leveling step for this sort of four-legged stool problem, we would have some issues. Okay, before we leave this topic, let's just consider the potential dilemma involved in ensuring uniform bearings for the case of full-depth deck panels being placed onto beams. Of course, once you have grouted the, build, the beam buildups, you have locked in the beam stresses. Based on details from other states that have utilized continuous deck panels placed on top of multiple beam lines, uh, typically the leveling process works like this. All of the leveling bolts required are required to be well lubricated and able to be turned by hand, and then, one, then are required to be torqued to the, the same amount across the panel, plus or minus 20%. So as the slide shows in the middle bottom, you can see the leveling bolt that's sitting in the middle of that beam there. And if you look at the picture on the right-hand side, you'll actually see those levering bolts sticking high on that panel. You can see two leveling bolts per panel over each beam line. And you, can you imagine you're, you're torquing each one of those to the same amount to ensure uniform uh, bearing? Let's think about this. You know, a beam is self-weight is about a third. The deck weight is about a third. The live load is about a third. So it's kind of a big deal if um, that panel isn't being um, uniformly distributed across all beams. I should note that we have tested this leveling process as part of a recent mock-up here in Tallahassee. And as you might suspect, achieving equal torque is very difficult because as you adjust one leveling bolt, you affect all of the adjacent ones. So you tend to either have a fully loaded bolt or a fully unloaded bolt. Maybe a softer foot on the leveling bolts like a neoprene might help. I don't really know the answer. The main point here is that the design assumptions have to be consistent with what is actually achievable in the field. I think that we still lack the project experience with this bridge type necessary to answer this fundamental question. Okay, switching gears. PBS barrier number two, the project variability quandary. Our biggest challenges given our current work mix continues to be how to best utilize PBS solutions to accommodate variability within a given project. In this interchange project example, complex geometric constraints necessitated both integral and non-integral hammerhead piers, multi-column piers of variable widths, C-shaped piers, and both integral and non-integral straddle piers. You can see the, the various uh, pier depictions at the bottom of the slide there. Precasting all substructure components for such a highly variable project would be difficult. Also, lifting weights of some of the larger elements would drive the crane size and overhead costs up. Integral piers pose additional challenges. Most require at least some cast-in-place concrete and temporary shoring to make the integral connections. Okay, on the quandary of project variability, there really is no easy answers. We do strongly suggest, however, that the extremes of the project be sketched during the BDR stage or as early as possible in the design. It's very helpful to draw, for instance, the widest bridge, the narrowest bridge, the tallest pier, the shortest pier, the various types of pier shapes required, the largest cross slope, smallest cross slope, longest span, shortest span, et cetera, those extremes. Once the extremes are established, it is easier then to determine whether precasting makes sense. I should point out that even if precasting is not deemed to be feasible, this process is a useful step in determining substructure pier shapes which maximize formwork reuse. And in fact, if you ref uh, I refer you to chapter 13 of the detailing manual for more information, and I think Although, as it's written now, Chapter 13 is mainly for cast in place and reuse, reusing formwork, it's a very also use, useful reference in looking at prefabricated uh, substructures as well. This is a simple slide depiction of a water pier which appears to be perfect for precasting using column sections of various heights and a precast cap element, maybe using rebar couplers and epoxies at match gas joints to connect the sections. Okay. 
as you look at the various pier heights within the project, everything looks doable, albeit some of the taller piers may require two column elements, not one due to lifting weight consideration. Everything looks fine until the shortest pier is looked at. You can see it there. The shortest pier is a problem because it requires a special form and also requires a different transfer template. A transfer template, if you look at the picture on the left-hand side, <clears throat> ensures that the rebar cast into the cast-in-place pier footing will line up with the rebar in the precast element. There's actually a barrel uh, um, that's part of that um, connection that has to, you know, the, that the rebar has to slide into. Lastly, the grout recess that you can see in the picture there for the short pier at the footing would be different. So that recess form is different. The point here is that these special cases need to also be considered when determining whether or not to employ PBS. Again, this just underscores the importance of looking at, looking, uh, of looking at the project extremes and outliers. It is sometimes the outliers that sway the final decision. With only one outlier, as in this case, precasting could still be very viable depending on the project specifics. The point here is that if you have too many of these sorts of outliers, precasting may be less practical. Okay, switching gears again. PBS barrier number three, the beam camber in pass, and this is a biggie. There are two primary challenges associated with pretension beam camber. The first is being able to predict the camber accurately so that the buildup of the beams in the longitudinal direction can be determined. See the top sketch showing the three-span beam option. The second challenge is, is being able to predict camber variability within a given span. See the sketch in the middle of the slide showing the pre-stressed slab girder cross-section at mid-span. So you can see that some of the units are a little high and some of the units are a little low. There are a lot of PBS components that are pretensioned and therefore are subject to camber. Here is an example of a deck girder system. This system has huge advantages from a structural efficiency standpoint, and the system virtually eliminates deck forming. But the system is simply not practical given FDOT's current precasting yard methods, which do a poor job at creating cambers which are predictable and repeatable. The camber variability between girders will likely exceed any practical sacrificial thickness allowance or, or even if you had like a wearing surface allowance, okay. Um, in the middle of the span you may have an inch and a quarter high or an inch and a quarter low relative to the adjacent uh, members, um, so that's quite a bit of sacrificial thickness to account for. Also given those differences, it would be difficult um, to detail the closure port to accommodate the, those camber differences between adjacent beams. In my example, it's like two and a half inches in the middle of the span. That'd be difficult to accommodate. And lastly, for multi-span bridges, deck rideability requirements are difficult to meet because of buildup inaccuracies. What you don't want is a roller coaster effect to go over those three bridges because you can't meet the deck planing requirements. Okay. I have seen attempts to include a camber leveling step using strong backs to force the high units down and the low units up. So let's think about that. You've got your, your, your deck girders there and you've got a strong back and you're going to basically clamp those all together and uh, to the same elevation and then, and then once you release the strong back, um, everything wants to spring back into place, right? But some basic questions come to mind. How do you define a camber leveling step in the contract documents? How do you employ this? Um, if a leveling step is included, has the design accommodated the additional stresses in the closure pores? Like I said, it all wants to spring back into place and you've got actually stresses you didn't include in your design. So how about the additional stresses in the units themselves? What about torsion at the fascia girders? Well, in the case of the roller coaster uh, comment, um, with uh, what happens if all the beams are high or all the beams are low. Um, yeah, you got a problem there as well. 
So I would argue that defining a leveling step like this is not practical solutions given, given the reasons that I mentioned above. Okay, certainly full depth deck panels placed on pretension girders have to account for camber variability. Detailing questions include what buildup heights are appropriate to accommodate camber variability? Because your buildups are going to have to be higher because you can no longer, like in a cast in place scenario, you can't allow the beam to inset, like say in the, to the bottom two inches of your deck concrete. So um, you got that issue. What should your, your uh, buildup be? Do all the beams on the bridge have to be in place and surveyed prior to grouting the first buildup? It's a bit of a quandary here. Um, certainly if you allow for a taller buildup, you might certainly helps this, but you know, um, uh, if you're trying to accelerate bridge construction, you probably couldn't allow you to what you know. You don't want to wait until all the all the, the beams are in place and surveyed. But you might have a high beam at some point, and you may have to to grind off one of the panels to make it work. Right. What are the best build-up form details to accommodate variable camber? And and this particular slide shows extruded polystyrene, which is uh, what's been used in other states and seems to be a pretty good method. Okay, so let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about camber variability. Certainly factors that influence camber include casting and curing temperatures. Um, here you can see the strength gain curve for the different casting and curing temperatures. On the, on the vertical axis is the compressive strength. On the horizontal axis is the day, uh, the age of the element, right? Notice that the largest difference in strength occur early on in the first few days. Okay, note that the first few days of curing typically correspond to the time that the strands are released given typical precast bed turnaround times. Okay, the point here is that casting and curing t temperatures is one factor which influence the repeatability and predictability of camber. And certainly another factor influencing camber is concrete deck, uh, the concrete mix design. It is the release strength, not the 28-day strength, which typically controls the mix design that precasters um, choose to use because they want to turn around their beds, right? Therefore, the designer assumes one strength gain curve to determine camber and buildups, but the actual strength gain curve is actually higher or stronger. As you know, programs apply correction factors to approximate the real strength gain curve when predicting cambers. Interesting enough that when we switched from the Florida bulb tees to the Ashto beam slate shapes, um, from, from the Florida beams and our Ashto beam shapes to the new Florida I beams, the actual cambers were about half of the predicted can, uh, values. This, of course, is because these new beams are inherently more efficient, and it is the stiffness term, the EI term, that has to be accounted for in the correction factor, not simply the E term. So the correction factor for the old beam shapes don't really work on the newer beams. So just kind of an interesting scenario here. Um, I apologize for this slide. It's not a really um, uh, good photo, but this, but it does show the strength gain. You can see the vertical axis again, concrete strength, and then log time in the horizontal direction here. Strength gain can be achieved by using steam curing with less additional cement added to achieve one to two day bed cycle times. This allows the actual mixes used by precasters to behave closer to the theoretical mixes assumed during design. Also, the controlled temperatures, one would think, uh, would likely make camber predictability and repeatability uh, much, much better, right? And, uh, and you can see the, the difference, the, the, the solid line in that, on that graph is the low pressure steam cured for 12 hours versus your standard seven day Morse cure. Um, so you can see the comparison. Okay, so let's, looking back, let's, we talked about camber here and let's, let's um, throw out a few ideas um, of, of how to make camber more predictable. One idea is to leave the beams in the stressing bed several days longer prior to detensioning. Here you've got to be a little careful about leaving them in too long because you get shrinkage cracking, right? So you might have um, to worry about that. Um, 
Another ex uh, possible solution is to require a specialty engineer to perform creep tests of the actual concrete mixes used by the precaster and then set buildups and pedestal heights based on the results of the actual precast yard turnaround times and mixes. I think that's a good, good one. Consider embedding a steel plate stiffener um, into the pre-stressed element similar to the sketch at the bottom of the slide. That's, that's a thought. Um, this one would work. Um, this is a good one. Require steam curing methods. I would argue that um, leaving the, bed, the beams in the bed may not be practical just because of the delays in the casting yard production rate. So that one may have some limitations. And I would also say including a creep testing step um, would be practical for certain types of projects, especially where you have a, a, a lot of beams or where you have uh, long bridges. So that, that may not make some sense for certain types of jobs. So let's go back now and look at uh, the deck girder example described earlier. What if we were to target mid-span camber accuracies to plus or minus an inch? Excuse me, plus or minus a half an inch with a one inch sacrificial thickness. <coughs> In this case, requiring creep testing of the actual concrete mix used allows for better approximation of the variable buildups required, right? So that'd be a good one. Several stiffening steps would likely be necessary, such as requiring steam curing or adding a stiffener plate. At least that's a, that's a thought. It is really a question of the benefits of utilizing this sort of deck girder solution versus the added cost associated with overcoming the camber predictability impasse to ensure the deck rideability requirements can be achieved. States that employ steam curing may find these sorts of deck girder solutions more acceptable. The point here is that when you at attend national conferences that recommended accelerated bridge construction solutions, that you must understand the conditions in which uh, a solution will or will not work. Okay, switching gears. Very number uh, four, settlement. If you're casting spans at a near site casting yard that are to be rolled into place using SPMTs, you have to be sure that the temporary supports match the relative geometry of the bridge, the bridge uh, substructure, right? Here there is a concern related to the settlement of the temporary supports. Unfortunately, Florida doesn't have the advantage of having some sort of pre-consolidated soils due to, due to glacier ice flows from the past or a lot of subsurface rock that many other states do. Therefore, we really have to pay attention to temporary shoring founded on shallow foundations. The issue here is that when the deck is cast on the beams, especially for the first time, that the shallow temporary supports will settle when they are loaded. So you have to address the issue as the designer and add the appropriate shop drawing requirements into the contract documents to control settlement to be able to and to be able to make the, the, the adjustments of the forming system if settlement does occur. Okay, before we leave this settlement predicament discussion, I want to discuss composite bed load design by using mid-span shoring, which makes the issue of settlement a little trickier because the mid-span shoring cre creates a continuous span, which is more sensitive to any differential settlement that may occur. Let me explain what I'm talking about. If you're going to construct a span on the side of the ro road and roll it into place, and you are in a non-de-icing state like Florida, why not shore, shore it during the deck placement to take advantage of the composite dead loads? In this case, you may want to require a monitoring and jacking provision in your specs depending on the site and subsurface conditions. Of course, this problem becomes less of an issue when you cast multiple spans on a large project say provided that the geometric uh, geometry and supports of the forming are checked and adjusted periodically, right? Okay, I'm going to switch gears here. I'm going to talk about the fit-up conundrum. When I think of fit-up, I think of preformed anchor bolt holes, which as you know are required to be cast into all piers and vents on structural steel projects to ensure proper fit-up of the prefabricated steel 
because it is unrealistic to assume that the piers and anchor bolts could be perfectly located. I remember when this was not an FDOT requirement back in the 1980s and the issue was potentially a very serious one if a contractor had to drill into the top of the cap to install repositioned anchor bolts. Not a very good idea for a hammerhead pier when, when the contractor is out there drilling into your main steel. The point here is that this sort of fit-up issue has to be anticipated by the designer in advance and details should be used to facilitate fit-up. That is why on segmental projects you typically see a closure port between all cast in place concrete elements and precast concrete elements. Here you can see construction of a two box segmental bridge which utilizes cast in place a cast in place integral pier, in this case it's a hammerhead pier. Notice the shoring be con being constructed to support the first precast segment on the right hand side of the bridge. After the first segment is positioned on the shoring and the ducts and the rebar are in place, then the closure pour is cast and then stressed using PT bars or tendons. The left hand side of the bridge span is completed and you can see the temporary shoring is still in place. In fact, the temporary shoring is, is there for two purposes. It's there to position the first precast segment and then to make the closure pour on each side, but it's also used to uh, carry the out of balance load of the balance cantilever construction. Okay. Fit up issues have to be anticipated by the designer in advance, and the details should be specific, which facilitate fit up. That is why this precast pier example utilizes rebar couplers um, um, to make the connections. And note here that all the match cast joints are shown to be epoxied, but all the non-match cast joints have to be grouted, right, to make that connection. And uh, as I noted earlier, that's why the, inter the interfacing precast elements and cast in place elements, such in this case as the pure footing, require transfer templates to ensure that the grouted couplers line up. You can see that on the bottom uh, picture there. Another common fit up issues found in PBS applications has to do with rebar conflicts. Here you can see a very successful pre-stressed unit section developed in Minnesota which eliminates the cracking in the, con the concrete topping at the joints. This is really a nice section and a good solution. However, as the slide shows, the rebar detailing makes unit placement difficult because of potential conflicts with the tails of the rebar overlap. So the units must be placed far enough apart so that the rebar does not conflict and then they're kind of slid sideways horizontally into place, right? One way to improve the detail and still take use of the, the, the benefits is, is to utilize 180 degree hooks and a stirrup which connects the two together by laps and what you do is you lower that stirrup in and then you thread these rebars down through the, those hooks. The point here is that it's important to visualize each member's placement with a crane. Most precast members are lowered vertically into place and details need to be provided which accommodate beam placement with no conflicts. Okay, here's a successful pier cap to pile connection detail which accommodates uh, the plus or minus three inch pile placement tolerance. You can see the pocket there between the pile and the precast element, it does accommodate the pile tolerances. A few other things to note about the detail aside from the pile tolerances issue include, first of all, it looks like this is a moment splice for a water pro uh, uh, project, more likely a ship impact job. So that's a, you know, you gotta make sure that that connection works in full moment. Um, I will also note, if you look closely, you can see that the concrete is actually done in two steps. You first have the, the non-shrink grout, which locks the pile to the precast element, and then you have a second concrete element, which actually fills that whole socket. Okay? Note that the concrete is performed from the top. Uh, there are no hidden pockets from view, so it's pretty easy to inspect. Also, if you look closely, notice the PVC pipes that are vertical there. And this avoids trapping air during the grouting process as you lock in that pile. Um, 
Also note that there's no steel to corrode at the corrugated interface or the shear key. That's a really, really cool detail there for a water job. Also note that the detail provides a good direct bearing point from the top of the pile to the bottom of the cap. And if you look closely at this picture in the bottom left, you can see the shims that are placed on top of that pile as that precast element gets lowered and, and adjusted. Okay, here's another uh, um, successful bent cap to pile connection detail, which also accommodates the plus or minus three inch pile placement tolerance. A few other things to note about the detail aside from the pile tolerance issues include the piles are centered directly under the pedestals and beam lines. Um, the designer chose to use cast in place pedestals which are cast monolithic with the connection concrete. So if you look closely at the picture you can see the pedestal steel that's bent straight there. All right so after that precast element gets put into place what happens is um, um, well, actually, you've got to put in the plug first, but then you place the element, and then um, you can you drop the cage in, and then and then you can um, and then you bend the steel down for your pedestal, and then you pour that all in one shot. So pretty pretty slick detail. Okay, here's here's a detail in some dr uh, recent draft ABC publications. Um, that I wanted to at least talk about. Here's a rolled steel double T with the precast deck where the beams were designed to be continuous for live load. <clears throat> and the main fit up issue has to do with this bolted uh, continuity plate connection that you see in the, the middle of the slide there. How do you ensure fit up without pre-assembling the whole bridge in the proper relative alignment on the side of the road so everything fits together, right? And how close does the, does the near side casting yard supports have to match the bridge pier supports? If the geometry of the bridge was fairly straight, one could maybe sub bore the holes in advance and then maybe ring them out once the beams are placed in their final location. And that would eliminate pre assembly. So that's a big savings. And you just ream the hole, right? Horizontal curves, of course, would be more difficult. They may require bent connection plates, etc. Bottom line here is to try to avoid details which require the full preassembly of the span, if at all possible. It can be done; it just costs money. Okay, I'm switching gears again. I'm talking about I'm going to talk about temporary loads. There can be many aspects of prefabricated bridge elements and systems and accelerated bridge construction where the design may be dictated by temporary load conditions. <clears throat> Handling stresses and the special equipment loading impose temporary loads which may actually control the design. Here is one example and I will cover a few more in the next series of slides. What about the design of a prefabricated spans which are constructed at the near side casting yard and rolled into place using self-propelled modular transporters? And you can see the picture there. Here it is important to include the assumed SPMT support locations in the plans. And of course the EOR needs to check the deck and the beams for the temporary cantilevered condition. You can see the cantilever sticking out there beyond the support. Certainly um, this top-down construction scheme which delivers partial spans across newly constructed viaduct to an overhead span launcher or gantry is a good example in which the temporary load condition will likely control the design of the bridge. Let's look at this slide a little bit here. Um, notice that the half span, if you look at the, 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 the SPMT shown in the bottom, are being delivered with SPMTs through the uh, previously completed bridge. It's being delivered to a span launcher which picks that half span up and places it on the empty span out in front. And it does that for both halves. And then the gantry um, gets forward and they, they do the next span. And the cool thing about this is the SPMTs can straddle that longitudinal closure core. So this is a really lightning fast way to build a bridge. Here, the designer has to determine the various equipment weights and equipment sizes in advance uh, of the bid so that the wind loading is on the equipment and equipment loading and the element self-weight can be applied to the structure. Therefore, it is important to show the design assumptions in the plans with the necessary contract language stating that if the contractor 
proposes something big, bigger from the standpoint of equipment or, um, or heavier, so from bigger from a wind load standpoint. The, the special engineer has to strengthen the bridge as necessary. The case study, which I will cover in the next few slides, includes a slight variation of a top, this top-down construction approach. Actually, the, the example that we're going to cover is a wider bridge that's being built in three sections, not two. Okay, enough about identifying barriers to PBS. Um, let's, let's, um, let's use the rest of our time today working through a specific case study. This case study combines two training case studies posted on our EDC website, and you can see the link there here. It involves a 10-mile managed lane viaduct to be constructed in the median of a, an existing interstate. Our challenge is to develop criteria and design features that, that we can implement to assure successful, a successful project based on what we have learned today. Our first goal is to design the projects such that a production rate of one mile of viaduct per month is constructed. I realize that there may be ramps and connections that may take longer, but for the purpose of today's exercise, we're going to concentrate on the viaduct part, and a rate of one mile per month of viaduct constructed is the goal. Okay, so let's describe our rapid bridge construction approach. The first challenge relates to the traffic restrictions of the underlying interstate. Let's assume here that a single lane closure may be allowed during the day during off-peak hours, okay? Let's assume that we can close two lanes of the interstate at nighttime. So let's start from that premise. And let's also say that we want a viaduct that's 85 feet wide, so a pretty wide viaduct, a four-lane viaduct. Based on crane lifting weights and the size of the the, or the width of the bridge, a hybrid cast in place precast hammer pier, hammerhead pier type is chosen. So the first step for each pier is to install the foundation and then cast in place the pier column <clears throat> during the day in situ. While you're doing that, you would be precasting pier wing elements two sections per side and you would be constructing them at a near site casting yard using match casting techniques. Okay, next the two short pier wing sections are lifted into place using a strong back, and you can see that in this, this slide here. Next, the pier wings are blocked and partially stressed to the cast-in-place pier head using PT bars, and this would be similar to what we normally do on span-by-span -span segmental construction, so nothing new here. This is just a different application. Then the closure pour is placed, and the beam pedestals are cast. Note that the first three steps in this construction sequence can be executed with little or no disruption to the interstate traffic. So that's pretty cool. Then at night, what you do is you enclose the two inside lanes and several, you might be able to place like five or six of these wings at, at, in one uh, closure, say, could be placed in stress, similar to balance cantilever segmental construction. So you apply epoxy and you stress your PT bars. Then you do the same thing on the right side. Uh, and then once you had these uh, stressed, you would go ahead and, and, uh, and uh, post tension those with tendons from tip to tip. So here's your finished pier. Okay. Um, so that um, takes care of the, the substructure. Now let's assume that the superstructure is cast in three sections, like I said, and you'd be casting that at the near side casting yard. Let's assume for the case of our discussion that these spans are going to be shored such that they are composite for dead loads. So we're going to take advantage of composite dead loads in our design. Okay, you can see the, the legs of the, of the gantry that I show in uh, orange there. Let's assume that the, the span sections are delivered from the previously completed spans using SPMTs to the span launcher, which puts them into place. Here you can see the middle section being placed. Here you can see the right-hand section being placed, and here you can see the left-hand section being placed. And here is the completed bridge once the longitudinal deck joints and barriers are poured. 
The really cool thing about this concept is, is as I said, the SPMT can straddle those longitudinal joints. Um, so that the you know the the longitudinal joints aren't in, on the critical path. So how many spans per day do you think you can place? Two? How about three or four? I would say that you can place them as fast as you can launch the gantry, or more likely as fast as you can construct the foundations and substructure. Right? Because that'd probably be on your critical path. Okay. Now. You, you kind of have an overview of the case study being proposed. What are some of the things that we've talked about that you as a designer uh, would likely need to be considered for the project based on what we've learned? Okay, let's go to barrier number one first, uh, the four-legged stool dilemma. Certainly the partial spans are going to act like a four-legged stool. So a leveling step is needed with variable width shims sized using feeler gates with a, uh, as the beam launcher places each span. The shims are installed and adhere to embedded steel plates in the bottle of the beams with epoxy, okay? All right, barrier number two, this is the project variability uh, um, quandary. The things I would look at are ways to construct the bridge over maybe any uh, arterials, say. Uh, can you self-launch the beam launcher through these areas? Maybe you could switch to steel, which is lighter, longer steel spans to span those arterials. Um, the idea is here to make sure that you don't trap your launcher and you can use it to its fullest extent. How would you tie in the various ramps? So um, this variability issue, you'd want to know the outliers. Um, how are you going to address those? Essentially, I would look at ways to address the non-viaduct, non-uniform portions of the job. Okay, barrier number three is beam camber. You probably wouldn't have much to worry about on this one since the decks are going to be cast in place at the near site casting yard. Uh, uh, typically the half inch deck planing uh, um, would, would certainly work here and meet all your writability concerns. So I'm good there. All right, settlement predicament. You know, we talked about continuous for, for live load here. The settlement barrier certainly would, you'd want to make sure that the settlement of any shallow temporary shoring at the near site casting yard is being monitored and adjusted with jacks to ensure that all design sum assumptions for your composite bed loads are met, right? So that's good. Barrier number five, which is fit up, there's several here. The techniques for constructing the hammerhead pier wings are the same as for balanced cantilever construction or segmental, so no problems there. You probably want to include the segmental spec for match casting, erection manual, geometry control, and all that in your, in your job. Certainly, if you use steel spans at the arterials, you'd want to include preformed anchor bolt holes in your tree cast elements. Um, I haven't mentioned what to do with the deck over the piers. There are a few choices. You could provide closure pours over, over the piers to allow the deck to be made continuous uh, and, and use steel uh, deck plates uh, to traverse these areas during construction until these pours were made. So, okay. You could put uh, a deck join at every pier. That that probably be less desirable from an owner's perspective. And and certainly you'd want to detail your, your longitudinal joints between the bridge sections, your three bridge sections, such that were no rebar conflicts as you lowered the sections into place. And you might want to use a uh, detail that we described earlier that you'd simply modify for a eight inch deck thickness. And you'd have to worry about your bar bins and Maybe bar terminators would work, but there's some there's certainly some options there. Lastly, let's look at barrier number six, <coughs> temporary loads. Here you've got a lot of design issues. The assumed beam launcher and SPMT loads would need to be given in the plans like we talked about. Of course, these loads would control the design of the substructure. And they'd, they'd also likely control the design of the superstructure. The lifting points of the spans to be rolled in would have to be given in the plans and the, and the deck and the beams would need to be checked for the temporary cantilever condition that we talked about. Also the foundation would need to be checked for the unbalanced condition for when the right um, substructure was in place but not the left, so that temporary out of balance condition and of course the, the wind area of the gantry itself, would need to, those assumptions would need to be put in the plans as well. Um, okay. Here's another quote by Thomas Edison. 
this is a very Midwestern attitude. As you may, you may know, Edison was born in Ohio and grew up in Michigan. But I think Edison lived the talk. He certainly accomplished a great deal during his lifetime. He didn't spend much time on worthless pursuits. I think you can say that. Let me read the quote. The quote here says, being busy does not always mean real work. The, job, the, the object of all work is production or accomplishment. And to either of these ends, there must be forethought, system, planning, intelligence, and honest purpose, as well as perspiration. Seeming to do is not doing. And I'll leave you with one more final quote from Thomas Edison that I think shows his determined attitude. And, and in closing, I will say that accelerated bridge construction and PBS strategies can be very powerful on the right project for the right reasons. It is important to understand how PBS design challenges are different than for conventional jobs and know how to best address these challenges to ensure a successful project. Being able to visualize the construction is the first the, is a good first step. If you want to learn more about some of the issues that I've discussed today, here is a link to the FDOT Everyday Counts training website. It is essentially a series of training video case studies. Today's Engineering Academy training will be placed on the FDOT Design Office Academy website and a copy will also be added to the EDC training website in the coming days. If you haven't been to the EDC training uh, website, I certainly invite you to visit the site, see what things you can take from it that work for you. So in summary, we have outlined some of the barriers to implementing prefabricated bridge elements and systems. We have also discussed some of the practical ways for overcoming some of these barriers. And we spent some time working through a case study which included various EBC components and accelerated bridge construction methods to determine the considerations that the EOR would need to include in the contract documents in order to ensure a successful project. Hopefully today's discussion will help you think about some of these detailing issues differently in the future to help ensure a successful job. Thank you for your attention.